what do you see as the major engineering or general hurdles yeah. that are in the way? Yeah. Um, so the first one is just the cost of building a single unit. So Fusion has, and it is actually interesting you talked about the about the different models that you have. So Fusion has um, one of its interesting limitations is that it's very hard, uh, it almost at some point becomes physically impossible to actually make small power units. Mm -hmm. Like a kilowatt, a thousand watts, you know, which is like a personal home, like you know, is about is about a thousand watts, or your personal use of an energy of of electricity is about like a thousand watts. Um, this is basically impossible in, in for a single you know unit to do this. Um, so like you're not going to have a fusion like power plant like as your furnace and or your electric heater in your home. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this comes from the fact that fusion relies on it being, it's not just that it's very hot, it's just that the fusion power is the heating source to keep it hot. So if, mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, get, if you go too small, it basically just cannot keep it hot. That's, um, so it's interesting is that this, so this is one of the hard parts. So this means that the individual units, you know, and it's, it, it varies from concept to concept, but the, the, the National Academies report that came out last year sort of put the, the benchmark as being like probably the minimum size looks like around 50 million watts of electricity, which is like enough for like a med, like a small to, you know, mid-sized city actually. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, uh, so that's sort of like a scale challenge. And in fact, it's one of the reasons why in Commonwealth and in other private sector ones, like we, they try to push this down actually of trying to get to to these smaller units, just because it re reduces the cost of it. Um, then probably, um, obviously, I would say it's an obvious one, like achieving the fusion state itself and high gain is is a, is a hard one. But we already talked about what kind of hurdle, what kind of challenge well, is that? That, that? That's achieving the right temperature density and energy confinement time in the fuel itself, in the okay. plasma itself. And so some of the so some of the the configurations which are being chosen have are actually uh, have quite a ways to go. In mm -hmm. fact, I've seen those. But what their their consideration is? Oh yes, but by our particular configuration, the engineering simplicity confers like an economic advantage, even if we're behind in a, in sort of in a science sense. Okay, mm -hmm. which is fine. That's, this is also what you get when you get a, an explosion in in the private sector. You basically are distributing risks in different ways, right? Which makes sense. Um, all of that good. But so what I would say is that the the next hurdle to really overcome is is about making net electricity. So like we need to see a unit or several units, like put using fusion in some way to put a meaningful amount of energy on the grid, because this starts giving us real answers um, as to like what this is going to look like. The full end to end. Process. The full end to end thing. So Commonwealth's goal is that I'll I'll just comment to Commonwealth because I'll take some you know some I guess some credit for this is that the the origins of Commonwealth were in fact in examining that like we could see this new technology coming forward this this new superconducting material and the origins of our thought process were really around designing effectively the pilot plant or the commercial unit it's called arc mm -hmm. which is actually the, the the step forward after spark and that was the or, the origins of it so all the things that were other parts of the plan like spark and the magnet were actually all informed totally by building something that's going to put net electricity on the grid and the so, timing of that, we still hope, is actually the early 2030s. So Spark is the design of the Takamak and Arc is the actual full end-to-end -end thing. It's like a thing that actually puts that energy on the grid. So Spark is named, you know, intentionally that it's like, it's on for a short period of time and it doesn't have a, it has, yeah, yeah you know, it's the spark of the fusion, you know, revolution or something yeah. like that, I guess we could call it. Um yeah, so those are those are so those are sort of pr the programmatic challenges of doing that, and um, you know, it's inter you, you asked about you talked about SpaceX. So what has evolved even in the, in the last year or so was, in fact, in March of 2022, the White House announced that it was going to start a program that kind of looks like a SpaceX analogy. That namely, wow. 
we've got these things in the private sector. We should leverage the private sector and the advantages of what they obtain, but also with the things like this is going to be hard and it's going to co- it's going to take a, co- quite a bit of financing. So why don't we set up a, a program where we don't really get in the way of the private sector fusion companies, but we help them finance these difficult things, which is how SpaceX basically became successful through the COTS program. Fantastic, right? And that's evolving as well too. So. Like the, the fusion ecosystem is almost unrecognizable from where it was like five years ago around those things. How important is it for the heads of the companies that are working on nuclear fusion to have a Twitter account and to be quite, cause you said you don't use Twitter. I don't use Twitter. Very much. <laughs> I mean, there there is some element to, and I don't think this should be discounted, whatever you think about uh, figures like Jeff Bezos uh, with Blue Origin or Elon Musk with SpaceX. Yeah. There is, a science communication, yeah. to, to put it uh, in nice terms, that's kind of required to really educate the public and get everybody excited and sell the sexiness of it. I mean, just even the videos of SpaceX, just being able to kind of get everybody excited about going out to space once again. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways of doing that, but part, I mean, I guess those the companies do well, you know, yeah. is is yeah. to advertise themselves, to really sell themselves. It is, yeah. Well, actually, it is, it, like, I feel like why, one of the reasons on, the, on this podcast, mm-hmm. and so, like, I, I don't have an official role in the company. And one of the reasons for, for this was also that it's interesting because when you come from, like, you're running a company, it's it makes sense. that they're, they're promoting their own product and their own vision, which t- totally makes sense. But there's also a very important role for academics who have knowledge about what's going on, but are sufficiently distant from it that they're not fully only self motivated just by their own you know projects or so sure. forth. And for me, this is, I mean, we 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 see particularly the problems of the distrust in technology, mm-hmm. um, and then honestly in the scientific community as well too. It will be. That one of the greatest tragedies, I would say, that if we go through all of this and almost pull off what looks like a miracle, like t- technologic and scientific wise, which is to make a fusion power plant, and then nobody wants to use it because they feel that they don't trust the people who are doing it or the technology. So we have to get so far out ahead of this. Like, so I give lo- lots of public lectures or th- things like this of of accessing a larger range of people. We're not trying to hide anything. You can come and see, you know, come do tours of our laboratory. In fact, I want to set those up virtually as well too. You might look at our P- uh, Plasma Science and Fusion Center YouTube channel. So we are reaching out through those media. Right. And it's really important that we do those things. But it's also, and but also then realizing, setting up the realistic expectations of what we need to do. You know, we're not there. Like, we don't have commercial fusion devices yet. And you ask, like, what are the challenges? I'm not going to get into any deep technical, you know, questions about what the challenges are. But it is the pathway not just to make fusion work technically, but to make it economically competitive and viable so that it's actually used out in the private sector is a non-trivial task. And it's because of the newness of it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like we're simultaneously trying to evolve the technology and make it economically viable at the same time. Those are two difficult coupled tasks. So my own my own research and my own drive right now is that fantastic Commonwealth Fusion Systems is set up. We have a commercialization unit of that particular kind, which is going to drive forward a tokamak. In fact, I was just... There, there, there's discussions or there's there's dialogues going on around the world with other kinds of ones like stellarators and so, which prefer different kinds of challenges and economic advantages. But what we have to, I know what we have to have. What we have to have is a new generation of integrated scientists, technologists, and engineers that understand like how what needs to get done to get all the way to the goal line. Because mm-hmm. we don't we don't have them now. So like a multidisciplinary. Team. Yeah, exactly. What's and, required? I mean, you you've spoken oh. about. Uh, you said that fusion is, quote, the most multidisciplinary field you can imagine. Yes, yeah. Why Why is that? What are the differences? Yeah, well, because most of our discussion that we've had so far is really like a physics discussion, really. So which, don't, don't neglect physics is at the for- origin of this. Um, but already we touched on plasma physics and nu- nuclear physics, mm-hmm. which are basically two, you know, somewhat overlap but independent disciplines. Then when it comes to the engineering, 
It's almost everything. So, so why is this? Well, let's build let's build an electromagnet together. Okay, what is this going to take? It's going to take. Um, it's basically electrical engineering, computer, in, so you understand what how it goes together, what it happens. Uh, computational engineering to model this very complex integrated thing. Materials engineering because it's this you're pushing materials to their limit with respect to stress and so forth. It takes cryogenic engineering, which is sort of a subdiscipline, but cooling things to extremely low temperatures. There's probably some kind of chemistry thing in there too. Well, actually, yeah, the, the, which tends to show up in the materials, and that's just one of the sub components of it. Like I, almost everything gets hit in this, right? So you're and you're also in a very integrated environment because in the end, all of these things. While you isolate them from each other in a physics sense, in an engineering sense, you ha- they all have to work like seamlessly together. So it's one of those. Um, am- I mean, I've, in my own career, I've basically done atomic physics, spectroscopy, you know, plasma physics, uh, ion etching. Um, <laughs> mat- so this includes material science, um, uh, something called MHD, magnetohydrodynamics, and now all the way through. And like I, I don't, I'm not even sure how many different careers I've had. It's also, by the way, this is also an, um, a recruiting s- stage for like young scientists thinking to come yeah. in. Like my comment to scientists: if you're bored in fusion, you're not paying attention because mm-hmm. there's always something interesting to go. And and do so. Th- that's a really important uh, part of what we're, we're what we're doing, which isn't new in fusion, actually, and in fact is in the roots of of what we've done at MIT. But holy cow, like the proximity of of possibility of commercial fusion is the new thing, you know. So my catchphrase is like, you may be wondering, like, why weren't we doing all these things? Like, why weren't we pushing towards economic fusion and new materials and new methods of heat extraction and so forth? Because everybody knew fusion was 40 years away. And now it's four years away. 